In this video, we discuss what is an emotion and what emotions have to do with ethics. Can you think of any scriptures dealing with emotions? There are many. Consider Alma 32.12. Use boldness, but not overbearance, and also see that ye bridle all your passions. Alma 32.12 is of particular interest from a primacy discussion. Being directed to bridle our passions implies that something other than emotions have primacy. What are we to bridle our passions with? Why bridle our emotions at all? What's the problem with just letting our emotions run wild? We Latter-day Saints have been singing the answer to these questions for many years now. Hymn number 336 says, School thy feelings, O my brother, train thy warm, impulsive soul. Do not its emotions smother, but let wisdom's voice control. School thy feelings, there is power in the cool, collected mind. Passion shatters reason's tower, makes the clearest vision blind. So if mind has primacy over heart, as these quotes suggest, what then is the purpose of emotion? One scholar explained, Most Greek philosophers held that emotions are not simply blind surges of effect. Rather, they are discriminating responses, closely connected with beliefs about how things are and what is important. If one really accepts or takes in a certain belief, one will experience emotion. The pursuit of intellectual reasoning apart from emotion will actually prevent a full rational judgment. For example, by preventing access to one's grief or one's love that is necessary for the full understanding of what has taken place when a loved one dies. Emotions can, of course, be unreliable, in much the same way beliefs can. They are not self-certifying sources of ethical truth. Reason is based on cognition of facts. Emotion is a response to personal values. Factual statements, via reason, are declarative statements of knowing what is the truth. Emotions, however, are evaluative responses, responding to what is at stake. To illustrate the difference between reason and emotion, consider knowing the fact that your spouse has died compared to experiencing the emotional grief-stricken loss. Or, perhaps someone is happy that their spouse has died because they hired the hitman in the first place in order to collect a large life insurance policy. The emotional response to facts is something for us to consider as an ethical question. As we deal with ethical questions surrounding emotion, we need to be aware of two cognitive judgments inherent in any emotional response. If we pause to consider any emotional response from love to fear to rage, we can notice that implicit in every response is a dual value judgment. Every emotion reflects the judgment of for me or against me, and also to what extent. Thus, emotions differ according to their content and according to their intensity. Strictly speaking, there are not two separate value judgments. They are integral aspects of the same judgment and are experienced as one response. Every emotion contains an inherent action tendency. That is, an impetus to perform some action related in that particular emotion. The emotion of fear is a person's response to that which threatens his or her values. It entails the action tendency to avoid or flee from the feared object. To help understand these two judgments, let's explain it diagrammatically. The world is full of many things that just exist, uncolored matters of fact. We use our reason to discover these cold, truthful facts of reality. As we come across these things, we also judge the value of them. Our value judgments cause us to interpret these things as being for me, represented in green, neutral to me, represented in yellow, or against me, represented in red. At first we see just the uncolored factual object, not knowing what is for me or against me, until we get more experience. Values are the things that we must act to gain or keep. We then sort these things into a hierarchy scale. According to the relative amount, these things are for me, neutral, or against me. We pay attention to the ones that are for me or against me, and generally ignore the ones that we don't care much about either way. For example, some people place a high positive value on golfing, and a somewhat positive value on marriage, and place a negative value on immorality, and place a very negative value on smoking. That which preserves or gains me the things I value is perceived as the good. That which threatens my values is perceived as the evil. Only when people's values are the same will their emotions be the same. Let's go through another example to illustrate this pattern of thinking, valuing, and acting. Consider the question, is owning a gun a good thing or a bad thing? 
Different people may have different emotions on this subject. We first perform the factual judgment by identifying what. After the factual judgment, we perform the value judgment, or so what. We ask ourselves, is this of value to me or of no value to me? Perhaps there are a high incident of attacks in the neighborhood and I value self-defense. So in this context, I perceive a gun as an aid to me in preserving my highest value, which is my life and my family's lives. So owning a gun is a good thing and is of value to me for purpose of self-defense. Having identified an aid to my values, I buy one and learn how to use it. This is the now what. Let's do another example, such as a hiring decision. We set up the interview, and the person turns out to be a clown. We evaluate what this effect would have on my values. I ask myself, is it of value to me or of no value to me? I think about hiring him for my child's birthday party, but working with a clown in an office setting would get very old very quickly. Having identified the what by factual judgment and the so what by value judgment leads to the now what. Values are that which we act to gain or keep. In this case, we take no hiring action in order to preserve or keep our current work environment as is. Emotions are lightning quick responses, what I perceive to be for me or against me. The formula for an emotion is perception plus value judgment equals emotional response. Let's go through an example of a mother and small child on a nature hike. As they are hiking, they come across a rattlesnake. The child sees something new for which he has no experience and wants to investigate. He sees this as something for me. The child feels curiosity with low intensity and moves towards the rattlesnake. The mother who has experience immediately sees the danger as against me. She experiences instantaneous fear with high intensity. Her body's adrenaline system automatically kicks in so she grabs the child and moves away from the snake. Again, the formula is perceptions plus value judgments equals emotional responses. The two judgments, the factual judgment and the value judgment, occur in the mind. The emotional response occurs in the heart. Notice the primacy issue. A common mistake people make is assuming the heart makes a value judgment. The heart doesn't make any judgments. The heart only displays emotional responses. Certain people can be the most dangerous creatures of all. When Christ described the Pharisees who were violently contrary to his values, he compared them to a generation of vipers as an emotional warning. Emotions are very helpful lightning quick shortcuts from all of the mental calculations that led up to them. Properly understood, emotions are a valuable aid in our survival. Imagine if every time you came across something, even if you had seen something like it before, you had to go through all of the mental calculations each time before you knew how to act. That is too slow in many instances. If that were the case, our ancestors would have been munched by bears or poisoned by snakes as they acted each time like this child. Emotions are not mysterious unless you don't understand the process that happens over and over in our lives. For example, consider the perception of getting a salary raise at work. You recognize the value judgment as for me, with an emotional response of jubilant. Consider the opposite perception of getting fired from work. You recognize the value judgment as against me, with an emotional response of anger, shock, or dismay. This simple pattern is followed over and over throughout our lives. It is a roller coaster, but it is not mysterious. There are numerous examples of this mind over heart primacy issue as an emotional roller coaster pattern in the scriptures. In the following examples, we have emphasized in yellow the factual judgment occurring in the mind before the subsequent emotional response. We have also colored in red those judgments and emotional responses perceived to be against me, and colored in green those judgments and responses perceived to be for me. Mosiah 25, 7-11 shows this process of mind over heart. It says, and now, when Mosiah had made an end of reading the records of Zenith, his people, who tarried in the land of Zarahemla, were struck with wonder and amazement, for they knew not what to think. For when they beheld those that had been delivered out of bondage, they were filled with exceedingly great joy. And again, when they thought of their brethren who had been slain by the Lamanites, they were filled with sorrow, and even shed many tears of sorrow. And again, when they thought of the immediate goodness of God and his power in delivering Alma and his brethren out of the hands of the Lamanites and a bondage, they did raise their voices and give thanks to God. 
And again, when they thought upon the Lamanites, who were their brethren of their sinful and polluted state, they were filled with pain and anguish for the welfare of their souls. Notice how their emotions oscillated back and forth between joy and sorrow based on the various thoughts and value judgments they had regarding the situation. Conviction is mind and heart aligned together. You can't have conviction with just mind alone or heart alone. In order to control emotions, one must first control the thoughts. Alma 62, 1-2 through 2 also shows this process of mind over heart. Notice in the following scripture how each emotion is preceded by a because. And now it came to pass that when Moroni had received this epistle from Pahoran the chief judge, his heart did take courage and was filled with exceedingly great joy because of the faithfulness of Pahoran, that he was not also a traitor to the freedom and cause of his country. But he did also mourn exceedingly because of the iniquity of those who had driven Pahoran from the judgment seat. Yea, in fine, because of those who had rebelled against their country and also their God. Each because in this scripture shows the factual judgment preceding the value judgment and emotional response. It is one thing to know the truth via judgment, and another thing to love the truth via emotional value response. This mind-heart, thinking-feeling sequence is amazing philosophically speaking, and a testament to the consistency of the Book of Mormon. It would have been so easy for a primacy of consciousness prophet to have gotten it wrong by declaring that an outside-the-box God mystically sent a feeling to them, filling their hearts with joy or sorrow. But instead, the pattern shows mind, think, thought, because, preceding the feeling. Doctrine and Covenants 9, 8-9 is very explicit in the primacy issue of mind over heart. The Lord, speaking to Oliver Cowdery, said, But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore you shall feel that it is right. But if it be not right, ye shall have no such feelings, but you shall have a stupor of thought that shall cause you to forget the thing which is wrong. Therefore you cannot write that which is sacred, save it be given you from me. Study it in your mind is required first to get the values right, then the spiritual confirmation will come. Spiritual confirmation is not the same as emotion, though strong emotions may accompany the spirit touching your spirit. Notice the conditional primacy issue language, then, if, and if not. All of this discussion describes the three dimensions of mankind, thoughts, emotions, and actions. As we covered in epistemology, mankind can think correctly or incorrectly. If we think correctly, we are rational meaning we are governed and persuaded by reason. Mankind is also fallible, meaning we are occasionally mistaken at best or evasive of reality at worst. Mankind's rational nature brings with it the capacity to enjoy appropriately or inappropriately. Mankind enjoying appropriately is again based on reason in the form of rational emotions. Mankind enjoying inappropriately is based on improper, misplaced emotions. With mankind's ability to think and move by emotions, mankind has the power to act, rightly or wrongly, based on what is good. Mankind acting rightly is guided by principle based on reason. Mankind acting wrongly means being misguided by mistaken reason. Mistaken reason, misapplied emotion, and misguided action undercuts the individual survival of mankind. Going back to our is-ought chart, with its descriptive truths and prescriptive truths, mistaken man is cut off from reality. With the bridge to reality gone, mankind is misguided and everything from the restoration disappears. The Holy Ghost only teaches of things that are real. No longer guided by reality or the Holy Spirit causes misplaced actions. Misplaced actions will never lead to eternal life. Improper actions blow up everything that is good in a person's life. When out of touch with reality and doing incorrect actions, everything spiritual disappears. When a person is mistaken, misguided, and misplaced, they stumble around in a dark fog, hoping for the best, but always looking over their shoulders, second-guessing themselves, expecting the worst. Ayn Rand said, When men abandon reason, they find not only that their emotions cannot guide them, but they can experience no emotions save one, terror. A word of warning. Emotion is not the same as reason, truth, spirit, or sincerity. 
President Howard W. Hunter said, Let me offer a word of caution. I think if we are not careful, we may begin to try to counterfeit the true influence of the Spirit of the Lord by unworthy and manipulative means. I get concerned when it appears that strong emotion or free-flowing tears are equated with the presence of the Spirit. Certainly the Spirit of the Lord can bring strong emotional feelings, including tears, but that outward manifestation ought not to be confused with the presence of the Spirit itself. Elder Orson F. Whitney said, We claim that the Christian world is in a state of apostasy, and though thousands and millions of them are perfectly sincere, just as sincere in their belief as we are in ours, still it devolves upon me as a servant of God to preach what I know to be the truth, and you can take your choice whether you accept or reject it. In other words, the truth doesn't care about your emotions. Truth is just the cold hard facts of reality. When telling the truth, we are not in control of how others will use their agency and emotions to accept it or reject it. The early Latter-day Saint leaders were perhaps a bit less politically correct in worrying about hurting people's feelings when it came to declaring truth. For example, Elder Heber C. Kimball said, Get the Spirit of the Lord and stop your whining, every one of you. This implies a directive for emotional control. Alma's instruction to bridle all your passions implies that emotions should not be allowed to run wild, independent of governing reason. Leonard Peikoff said, No matter what his emotions, a sane man retains the power to face facts. If an emotion is overwhelming, he retains the power to recognize this and defer cognition until he can establish a calmer mood. The authors of the book Crucial Conversations said, Emotions don't settle upon you like a fog. They are not foisted upon you by others. No matter how comfortable it might make you feel saying it, others don't make you mad. You make you mad. You make you scared, annoyed, or insulted. You and only you create your emotions. Once you've created your upset emotions, you have only two options. You can act on them or be acted on by them. That is, when it comes to strong emotions, you either find a way to master them or fall hostage to them. Nicolene Peck said, From the beginning of time, the forces of evil have tried to get the forces of good to lose control of their emotions. If we lose emotional control, then we are easily manipulated by the evil force. The evil forces would have us selfishly destroy all our most precious relationships by losing control of our emotions. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to the Christian Eternalism YouTube channel and visit www.christianeternalism.org.